You're listening to Thunder Quack Podcast Network. Hi, this is Simon Furman, and you're listening to the Epic Marvel Podcast. Hello, this is the Epic Marvel Podcast. I'm your host, Curtis Findlay, and thanks everybody for joining us for this interview with Transformers writer Simon Furman. Now, we're going to be very specific with what we're talking about today. We're only going to talk about the U.S. material that Simon wrote for Marvel in the 80s. We'll save the U.K. stuff for a little bit later. But as an added bonus, there is a little bit of G2 Transformers talk at, toward the end of the interview, so you may be interested in that as well. Uh, just before we get started, I want to make sure everybody knows about our social media. Just look up Epic Marvel Podcast on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube, and you can find us all there. I appreciate all of your support, your likes, your subscribes, all of that. And if you're looking for Epic Collections, you can uh, you can go over to DyingBreedCollectors.com and uh, enter the code Epic Marvel Podcast and get yourself an extra 10% off of any of those Epic Collections that you want to order through that website. So without further ado, here is my interview with Transformers writer Simon Furman. What is the biggest difference between Marvel UK and Marvel US in terms of just being contracted to write stuff? Because you've worked on both sides. Uh, yeah, Marvel UK and Marvel US weren't that dissimilar, except in terms of how much quantity of original material they were putting out. You know, Marvel UK was always a, a satellite division of Marvel US. And, you know, over the years before I sort of joined both staff and the writing team, you know, there was a there was a fair bit of original material. You know, there was Captain Britain, there was Night Raven. They even did some originated orig- Incredible Hulk material in one of the comics. Right. So there was always a move. There was Black Knight. You know, so there'd always been this dabbling with a certain amount of original material, but it was never, you know, very much of what Marvel UK did. Marvel UK was largely a reprint company. You know, it took the Marvel US stories and repackage them for the UK audience where, you know, the actual Marvel comics weren't as readily available. Right. We we before direct market, before a lot of comic shops even, although there were a few. And it, it just was, there wasn't the distribution then. And so there was quite a, a good market for uh, reprint Marvel comics. And, you know, they're the comics I grew up reading. Things like uh, Mighty World of Marvel, Spider-Man Weekly. These were all repackaged uh, Marvel strips, often multiple in one comic. So Mighty World of Marvel might have had Hulk and the Avengers and and so forth, all in the same comic. You know, maybe a third of a comic or half a comic, a, a Marvel US comic. So, you know, that was the kind of background to Marvel UK. But always was this, you know, desire, I think, to create their own material. And when I joined Marvel UK, first of all, just as a writer and then as an editor, there was much more of a move to be proactive in creating original material. So, you know, I came in at a time when Transformers was launching and that kind of set off a whole wave of licensed comics that needed original strip. So, you know, and then it then it rolled into things like Dragon's Claws and Death's Head and right. titles. So, you know, by the time I took over on the Marvel US comic, I'd already done quite a lot of original comic material. Now, I've spoken to Bob Budiansky a, a number of times here, and he said that uh, writing for Transformers was, uh, it was very it was difficult in the fact that the the toy company kept saying, hey, we have a new line of toys that we really want you to promote. Can you put them in here? Did you have those same 
issues or, uh, or, or mandates with the UK stories that you wrote? Uh, not so much. You know, Bob, you know, I felt sorry for Bob often because he took obviously the brunt of that. You know, we dealt with Hasbro's UK office and every now and then they would ask us to tie a story into a particular toy release, uh, you know, and that worked well for us because it meant that we could tag onto their TV promotional ads for the toys. So often we would get a huge boost in sales because the comic would feature in the same bit of TV advertising oh, yeah. as those toys. So, you know, when it came to the new leaders, which were Ultra Magnus and Galvatron and Headmasters, we would often, you know, get this reciprocal benefit, same with special teams, by doing a, a, a story, you know, even if we had to really get creative um, in in terms of our chronology to get those characters in, right. it was definitely worth our while. So, but we didn't have the same mandate to keep bringing in next wave of one wave of characters, which Bob did. You know, you could almost see Bob clean house, yep. so he could <laughs> another sort of thirty characters in. That's right. Wow, we we didn't really. We were left more alone, and to do to explore avenues like the movie characters, the animated movie characters, and mm-hmm. continuity. You know, so it, we in many ways we got it light really. And when we did team up with Hasbro, it was always very good for us in terms of sales. Then, when you came to write the U.S. stories, did you find that you had a different? Uh, different relationship then with with Hasbro because you would have been dealing with the US Hasbro or was that up to the editors? Uh, it was a little bit up to the editors, but um, you know both uh, initially Don Daly and then Rob Tokar used to I think rely on me as they relied on Bob to know what Hasbro would accept want you know not do stories or feature characters that were wrong for the comic. So I think there was a fair amount of trust on the part of Don and uh, and Rob that we wouldn't mess up. And, you know, I mean, the reason I, I got the U.S. book in many ways was I think uh, Bob just basically said to Don Daly, look, here's a guy who knows this probably as well as I do, maybe more. Certainly it's a safe pair of hands if, you know, now I want to sort of pass the book on. Right. So, you know, really it was... It was one of those weird transitions where, you know, normally it's the editor making those decisions. But uh, Bob and Art, Bob came over to London in, um, I suppose it would have been 1990, 1989. And we, yeah, probably 1990. And we, and, you know, we always rolled out the red carpet for our visiting guests from Marvel US. But yeah. by then, Bob and I knew each other anyway. So we just went out for a lunch in, in London's Covent Garden. And over lunch, Bob just kind of said to me, do you want to take over on the book? And then he more or less went to Don, as far as I know, and said, look, Simon can take it on. So it was just a weird, casual almost transition. But I think Bob just wanted as much as anything to leave the book and Don, you know, and not leave Don high and dry with having to sort of bring a new writer in who didn't know the the brand and didn't know Hasbro. Right. Yeah. So was that your introduction to US Marvel? It was. So I was completely delighted to to grab it with both hands, yeah. really. Yeah. You know, Bob, you know, when we had this lunch, he was quite, you know, the book is, you know, Transformers. By this point, Transformers as a toy line was kind of in its last gasps, really, of new releases of toys. You know, it was winding down and Hasbro's attention was a little more on other brands and newer brands right so you know it was it was a time when the sales on the comic were going down accordingly you know a lot of the original readers were growing up and moving on and bob said to me you know the chances are this book will be cancelled within a few issues (laughs) yeah you know and that's okay you know i mean i was i I would always prefer that kind of level of honesty anyway for sure yeah and and, you know and i was also thinking well i don't really mind that much because you know it's my foot in the door at marvel you know you know always been a a cherished ideal to be working for marvel the parent company right that i'd grown up reading and my hope was once i'd opened my account on transformers i could move on to other things 
So, you know, I was happy with that. But, of course, as it turns out, we spun it out for 25 issues. Yeah. And you were still working on the UK uh, Transformers at the same time. Is that right? Yeah. You know, the, again, even the UK comic by this point had wound down a little in terms of its sales. And, you know, we used to do 11 pages of color originated strip. And that had been cut back to five pages of black and white per issue. Okay. You know, just the sales were down. The budgets weren't quite as you know, giving for that amount of originated strip. So it had become this little, you know, the whole thing was slowly but surely winding down. And But yes, I was still writing all of these five-page black and white strips, which, uh, you know, we recently got coloured up for uh, this series called the Definitive G1 Collection, which we've just put out here in the UK. Okay, I'm going to have to track that down. Yeah, the I've really enjoyed looking through. I haven't had a real chance to dive through them, but the, the depth of the, the IDW UK releases... Um, have been really fantastic and I'd love to see that completed um, to get the full run there Uh, but that's yeah that's great so when you jumped into the U.S. uh, the U.S. book uh, did you have to were you keeping up with what was happening with the uh, with the comic the U.S. comic at the time because I know it yeah it was um, it was still being featured in the uh, the UK magazine right yeah I mean yeah we had to be all the time you know cognizant of what Bob was planning in the US because our stories would run for say eight issues and then we would be back into a run of the US material right so we had to always as much as possible as much as Bob and Marvel US could supply us to know what Bob's plans were so that we didn't clash with that and that's really why we focus so much on the future cast from the animated movie, right, because yeah, it's yeah. about just to tell stories where we knew it wasn't going to clash with something that Bob might or might not be doing in a future story of his. Well, so sense. yeah, we were completely up to speed with where we were leading off, and Bob came over armed with some Xeroxes of the latest issues that, you know, they put together. So I was really just, here's where it is. These are the characters. We were sort of in the era of these MicroMasters, the small Transforms. So, you know, we were right at the end of the toy releases. So, you know, my first story rolls right from Bob featuring a lot of these MicroMaster characters into me bringing more of those teams into the mix. But at the same time, already wanting to go, well, I want to bring the characters I want back into the mix as well. Yeah, that was really interesting to see at the very beginning. It's kind of this this big shift of uh, we haven't seen these guys in forever. And now all of a sudden you come in and they're back. It's like Megatron's back and we see Ratchet and all these guys. And you kind of even shove to the side kind of the whole idea of like the binary bonded humans and, and all of this kind of other stuff that Bob had been like maybe forced to kind of put in there. Um, what was your opinion on a lot of these uh, these new concepts that he'd been exploring before you came on? There's nothing wrong with anything Bob was doing, you know. Right, I mean, I think you know, I think he had a lot again, a lot of stuff to get in there. But you know, I didn't really throw, didn't want to throw the sort of the baby out with the bathwater when I came in. I really wanted to continue Bob's, but you know, immediately start to layer in. You know, we'd always done these more. I suppose, cosmic stories in the UK comic or time travel and other worlds. And, you know, obviously they'd done a bit of that with Nebulos and Cosmic Carnival and a few things like that. But I really wanted to bring in some of the, you know, the big sort of mythical things that we'd laced into the UK continuity, you know, like Unicron like Primus, mm-hmm. you know, and and really broaden it out into a, a bigger kind of epic story. And, I, you know, we felt it needed a shot in its arm at this point. And, you know, and again, that's nothing against what Bob had been doing. But, you know, it had got very stuck on Earth and very sort of, you know, just sort of the, the stories weren't the far-reaching stories that Bob had started out doing. They'd become smaller, I guess. And we wanted to really broaden that canvas out again. So, you know, right away it was like, you know, and and I think also we were motivated by that conversation with Bob where he'd said, you know, we're liable to get cancelled in four issues. So it's like, well, (laughs) 
you know, we might as well throw everything in, yeah. Megatron, gods, monsters, you know, the lot of it. And so right. very, very rapidly, you know, I started to try and pull some elements of the stuff we'd been doing in the UK. And just generally to give it, you know, very quickly, we did a story called Matrix Quest, mm-hmm. which went to multiple worlds and started to make the Transformers feel, I suppose, like more a bigger some part of something bigger something more a cosmic world that they inhabited where they were known and you know respected or feared or rival there were rivalries so you know i think it was just this idea of you know we've we've got nothing to lose let's put it all out there let's go sort of fully cosmic let's have a decepticon civil war let's have Unicron on the way. And, you know, we really just threw everything we could think of at it to, to I suppose, just re innovate readers. Yeah, and it was not just the concepts, but it was the way you told the stories too. The the whole thing with Unicron, I think that was like over the course of a whole like 12 months of comic, uh, not comic time, of real time. Like he's mm. just there uh, on his way to Cybertron, and like it was that tension that you were building and everything going on. Um, Bob, uh, he was very much in the kind of the older style, which is still great of these single stories, maybe two part stories and such. But um, coming in and bringing this whole this whole concept of longer, like playing the long game and uh, and really stretching out the storytelling, I think is something that really helped reinvigorate things as well. Yeah, I mean, we tried as much as possible to do that thing that, you know, comics like Claremont's X-Men did really well of having always having bubbling story threads. So there might be, you know, one or two issues focusing on something, but at the same time, in the background, you've got Mastermind right. seducing Grey or something like that. You know, there's always, you know, a build-up, but you've still got a sort of issue or two-issue focus. But meanwhile, the another storyline is is gathering like a storm behind it. Yeah. So I think that was, that was the kind of thing we were trying for, that there was always a pull onwards and always a reason to pick up the next issue. So very few of the issues finish in any conclusive way or, you know, they may jump suddenly into an alternate future or go back to earth for one issue but at the same time everything else is still ticking along you know even in the one we called the human factor it was very much here's our super team and circuit breaker and a few other things but meanwhile shockwave is coming back into the picture and starscream is being recruited and you're building to the civil war so I think that was just the plan with it. It was just to make it more of a book. People felt the need to pick up the next issue and the next issue and the next issue. And obviously the fans responded because you were able to stretch this out for two years. Uh, mm. Did you did you notice the, um, the, the, the rise or the resurgence in that popularity or the interest, I guess? I mean, I think, honestly, we lived almost issue to issue, really. I don't think we ever saw sales figures as such. You know, I think, you know, clearly the fact that we were still in there was always a good sign. Right. You know, as long as I think, you know, it's weird to think of it in the day, but Marvel US books used to face cancellation at or under about 100,000 copies. (laughs) Yeah, well, yeah. Which is just these days, you just kind of go, wow. Yeah, that's a good day for Marvel now. Yeah, that that would be like number one best-selling comic or something. But but in those days, of course, with newsstand distribution, yeah, as well as the you know fledgling direct market, the figures were huge, and under a hundred thousand meant you were in danger. And you know, I think Transformers was under that, but it had we'd steadied it. I, whether we grew our readership or just held on to our readership, but whatever the case, the axe didn't fall until, like you say, a couple of years later. When did you finally get the word that Transformers was going to be cancelled? Well, it, it was very short notice. You know, we'd st- after issue 75 and we bought the Unicron story to a close... Really, we had another year's worth mapped out in terms of the search for the last Autobot, yeah. what's happening to Cybertron, Bludgeon's, you know, sort of splinter group. <clears throat> really, I've mapped out quite a long storyline. 
you know, including what was happening on Earth with Galvatron and and really, you know, we barely got started on that when it was like, now you've got to wrap it up. Oh, man. <laughs> you know, really, I think we had, we probably knew with about three issues to go that we had to bring it to a close. So, you know, if you look at 78, 79 and 80, mm -hmm. they're really condensed in terms of moving things along. You know, and suddenly yeah. things that we were going to have be protracted, like Grimlock unable to transform, you know, the whole action master thing and uh, the search for the last Autobot, uh, it was all going to go on for much longer and have other diversions, digressions. There was going to be more to the Galvatron storyline. But in the end, it was just like, we need to wrap this up really, really quickly. Right. Now, did you get to eventually use some of those concepts later on that you didn't didn't get to explore further? Um, well, we when we got to do Regeneration One, some of those things we just left dangling, you know, like Grimlock being stuck in a non transformable robot body. Yeah, we got to at least take those on and say now we can pick that storyline up, but. Obviously, we tidied things up enough that some storylines simply weren't going to fly anymore. Right, yeah. You know, we'd restored Cybertron. We'd had the last Autobot and all these things. So, you know, a certain amount in the condensing meant we couldn't do anything with it. But all the things we couldn't really get to, we managed to bring to some sort of conclusion, you know, at a, at a better pace in Regeneration 1. Um, what's your method of writing? I know that uh, a lot of Marvel writers ha did their kind of the Marvel style, as they called it. Were you a Marvel style guy, or did you like to write full scripts and pass that off to the penciler? Well, in uh, obviously in the UK office, we worked on uh, the full script for that. That was just the way the UK worked. Yeah. So you know, all my initial writing had been in that format of panel to panel, all the dialogue in at script stage, and maybe you tweak the dialogue later but actually you know when the, the mar job at marvel us came up that's just not the way they worked so very rapidly i had to get used to and you know we'd seen it we'd seen bob's plots for you know many years beforehand so we we knew the form and i knew the form but it was a, a kind of it, it took some getting used to not having that luxury yeah. of really tying the dialogue to the panel progression, which we're so used to with full script. And of course, is how everything happens now. Right. Did you enjoy that experience of doing it Marvel style? I did. And, you know, often you were really pleasantly surprised because, you know, you leave so much more to the artist. You, you know, you give them so much more freedom. So sometimes the pages come back, came back and you were just like, wow, that's not exactly how I exactly envisioned it. But in fact, that's kind of more inspirational and nice. it's going to be fun to layer the dialogue into that. So, you know, I got a lot out of it and, you know, worked that way on everything pretty much that followed that. Things like Alpha Flight and What If and She-Hulk. So for several years, I was working full script for the UK and plot style for the US. <laughs> uh, and, and that didn't get confusing for you? Uh, no, not too, not too bad. No, you know, good. I mean, I, and you know, it was always better when I was working with artists like Andrew Wildman and Jeff Senior, yeah. because obviously I could just pick up the phone and talk to them. Right. So uh, they would get a plot, and they might say. They might pick up the phone and go, what do you want here? What should I do? And we could talk it through a bit. But when it went to Jose or, you know, say Pat Broderick for Alpha Flight, you were more in the sort of lap of the gods in those days. And the artwork would come in and you would just have to work with that. And oh, work yeah. uh, what were, let's talk about these artists for a little bit. So the three main artists you had during Transformers, I think, were Jose Delbo and Jess Senior and Andrew Wildman, and they all three of them have very different styles. Uh, how did you relate to their styles in terms of your writing? Uh, yeah, sometimes you wouldn't know who was going to be drawing a given issue. Oh, okay. Sometimes you did. Once, obviously, once Andrew was on the book, it was just Andrew, and I knew I was writing for Andrew. But say, I don't know whether I would have known that Jeff would have drawn issue 61, 
which is the debut of Unicron right. in the league. But, you know, so pleased he did because, you know, I don't know whether Jose would have got that sheer epicness of that sort of final shot. And mm. the fact that, you know, I we did know Jeff would come in and draw the double size issue 75. Oh. So and Andrew knew, we knew with Andrew's schedule, he couldn't really squeeze a, a double sized issue into it. So we'd all we knew we had De- Jeff sort of lined up for that one and I may even have had a script or parts of the pages with him ahead of issue 74 being written so you know it, it was handy to know with that one because with Jeff you know I feel a lot more relaxed in terms of if I want something epic the chances are Jeff in fact, Jeff can't really draw anything but epic. So, yeah. you know, you know that this huge battle is, you know, where you have a double page spread of Unicron taking a big bite out of Cybertron. It's going to sort of be jaw dropping, you know, and that's not to downplay Jose's work, which was also fabulous. And, you know, Jose, I think really my working relationship with Jose really sort of, I, I think he was enjoying the issues, you know, once we got to, wild west ones and yeah. you know, the sort of future one with galvatron he really seemed to be sort of enjoying it and cutting loose a little bit so you know yes they were very different to work with but you know all of them had their merits and their style you know jose was much more good at getting the robots looking like the robots right you know with uh, the, the the sort of style guide bits you know jeff was a bit more fast and loose and would often have a lot of shadow and shading, let's say, to, you know, sort of not to have to put every little detail in. And Andrew had this almost humanizing style to them. So, you know, each had their own little quirks. And overall, I never found it too jarring, even when we would go to Jose, from Jose to Jeff or Jose to Andrew. It felt very much like Marvel UK had been, where we had American material, then British material. And then the British material would sometimes be drawn by five different artists in one storyline. So, you know, I was kind of used to chopping and changing art styles. And it it didn't really detract for me from the story I was trying to tell. Well, that's good. Yeah, I really like all three of those styles. I think you hit the nail on the head right there with, uh, with your descriptions, especially Jeff being kind of fast and loose. That really helps with his the epicness of the tale. Like he he uses large panels and he has very um, harsh like brush lines and yeah, absolutely. I mean, and you know, we lucked out that you know he got to draw some of those really key issues in the run. Yeah, and you know, recently some of his artwork surfaced. He 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 didn't really hold on to his artwork and a lot of it i think got thrown and oh, no. some of his original pages for issue 65 had resurfaced some somebody had actually sent them back to jeff he'd given them to this guy years before and they just sent them back and uh, jeff wow. posted them his um his facebook and twitter and you know it was lovely to see the pages again and when you see them in black and white they're somehow even more dynamic than the printed version in color. Right. Yeah, I'm sure they are. You get all the nuance that gets lost in the reproduction. Yeah. That's very cool. Yeah, and Andrew Wildman, I like how you say that he brought a more human approach to the Transformers because that's so true. They're, they just seem more rounded and natural, not as stiff as, as they had always been because you're playing off of the model sheets. Yeah. It was perfect for the, for the end, ramping up to the end where you have these huge battles because he... He put so much detail and effort into into all of his uh, panels. Yeah, Andrew was really good. I mean, Andrew, I think Andrew would much rather have been drawing superheroes than yeah. rob- robots. So you can see that in a lot of his work that he rounds them off a little bit more, makes them sort of more like muscular humans in armor yeah. than just sort of boxy robots. And that was, you know, that was great. It, it added a whole, another level of, of flow to the pages and you know he was he was great you know when it came to do the mashed up megatron ratchet creature oh yeah you know, it, he really under you know he really got how to try and fuse two robots together and not make it just look completely awkward yeah he's fantastic and i, I think that it was a perfect time for that i don't know that you could get away with his style as much 
these days because there's such an emphasis on the whole I, I like maybe the 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 anime mecha kind of aspect to Transformers now. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, Transformers art, art as, as a whole these days is so much more detailed, so much more, you know, sort of from, ev- you know, every nut and bolt and, yeah. and sort of fin and everything else. And that's mostly because most of these artists are sort of toy fans or comic fans who grew up with the brand. And so they understand it far more completely artistically than the likes of Jeff and Andrew, who were doing it more as this is the job of work I've got on in right. the comics at the moment. Oh, interesting. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, yeah. I feel often with the likes of Nick Roach and, and Alex Milne, and, you know, it's an absolute labor of love. Oh, you yeah. know, Don, Don Figueroa, who I worked with during the Dreamwave era, you know, he was he was amazing. He could draw every Transformers character without reference. Oh, I sat next to him in a convention one time, and, you know, there were a line of people coming up for sketches, and they would come up with characters I hadn't heard of. <laughs> <laughs> and Don would just start drawing. And I, I, you know, I would just watch with fascination because he seemed he could do them all from some kind of memory archive of his own. Yeah, that's amazing. Incredible. Jeff and Andrew, bless them, they'd still need to reach for the reference books for most of the characters. Yep. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's sure a lot of characters. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, one of the things that I really like about the Matrix Quest story is that you have all of these different like motifs uh, of the the worlds, like uh, fi- the the different references to film or literature. Um, yeah. w- why did you decide to go in that direction for that storyline? Part of enjoying writing any comic is is having fun yourself. Yes, you know I I loved you know I'd already used. The night, the nightbeat character in a little, a couple of little five-page stories where he's like a private eye, and we were riffing on Raymond Chandler. Yeah. So the first chapter of Matrix Quest was just another one of those UK ideas given more room to breathe. Okay. So you know, we did the private eye, Maltese Falcon pastiche in that one, and you know, nightbeat features very heavily in it. And then I just thought, you know, it's nice to go to. You know, not just planet after planet, where they're almost like homogenized sci-fi planets. I really wanted to do the Western world and then the the ocean world and bring into those all these other influences. Like, you know, there's nods to Shane yep. in uh, Western one. The uh, the Deadly Obsession one is obviously Moby Dick. Yep. But as somebody pointed out recently on social media, there's a whole page that's a big reference to Jaws. Right. Where boats are turning up in a harbour and the harbour master's going spare and saying they're all going to sink. Yeah. And so I, I was just having fun. And then the sort of next part is aliens and an alien. And, and so, you know, I just, I, I suppose, like anything, you just want to be enjoying it yourself and hope that that enjoyment then translates itself to your readership who can kind of get how much you're enjoying it and enjoy it themselves. Oh, yeah. yeah no, it's great. I, I totally enjoyed that for sure. It, it's just fun to be able to see uh, see you also just doing something different with it and exploring the new concepts and such. So it was a, yeah, it's a great storyline. Uh, and that that actually reminded me of a new question. Um, you you mentioned that the you had done those short five page stories that were using the same concepts as uh, the first part of the Matrix Quest. What's the did you find it difficult to having to jump into writing whole twenty two page stories rather than doing more short form stuff? No, in many ways the the longer ones are easier, better because you know you can you can your story can have room to breathe. You know, the, some of the five pages were done in one stories. Yeah. So it's almost like, you know, a gag with a punchline. Uh. You know, they, they had to be really short and sweet and bam, you're out of there. But obviously with the, the longer stories, you know, sometimes actually we were down initially to about 16 or 17 pages and the issues were padded out with fat files. Yeah, right, right. You know, it, it wasn't until we 
kind of got into the 70s where we were in full size issues again and but yes it was it was liberating to have that amount of space of and be able to just cut loose you know we couldn't it was hard to do anything big or epic or uh, far reaching in those five page storylines you know we tried a few to be continued ones but the general rule of thumb with those was don't have any big epic story arcs going on in case as with the US, we were worried about the axe falling in the UK as well. I'd like to talk a little bit about the the very short-lived Generation 2 series from Marvel uh, that came up a few years later. How did that come into existence? Yeah, I mean, you know, when we got to issue 80 of the original G1 comic, not that we called it the G1 comic then, but right. the original comic, you know, when I sounded off, on the letters page signed off um i very much expected never to come back to transformers so huh. it was a big, it was a big surprise to me when suddenly there was a generation two and once more marvel were you know doing the comic book and i, I was really pleased I, you know i was doing other stuff now for marvel so it was very much a kind of add-on to the things i was doing for them like alpha flight and so forth but, you know, I was delighted to jump back in and very excited with Derek Yaniger's art, which, you know, really was something quite breathtakingly different. Yeah, sure was. And again, you know, we just thought, well, let's go large with this. Let's not be coy. Let's go large. And then the, always the plan was to go slightly larger still, sort of to pull back and see an even bigger picture. So after the first 12 issues there would have been an even bigger scope to things and just keep doing that really with it. You know, in the end, we only got the first 12 issue arc out there, but we kind of teased at the end of that, that there was more or would have been more afterwards. Mm -hmm. But you know, I enjoyed Generation 2 and there was, you know, low or no, you know, interaction with Hasbro in terms of what we must do. Oh. You know, you had the G2 toy lines and we could pretty much, as long as we were featuring the main characters, do as we wanted to. And it was that sort of 90s, somewhat big guns and bullet belts yes. <laughs> vogue that was on at the time. And we applied that liberally to Generation 2. That's right. You sure did. <clears throat> yeah, some of the the sort of, they were a lot, you know, the first issue has the kind of cover line, these are not your father's Autobots. <laughs> Transform, but, yeah. but but anyway, and that was a kind of statement of intent. It was just like, well, we didn't think it was going to be the same audience at all. So we felt it had to start off quite fresh, quite in your face, grab people and pull them along. Did you find that the audience was receptive to this new Transformers series? I mean, it didn't last no. long, so it didn't pick up didn't team. Last. I, mean, I, I don't feel sales ever really got to the place we want they wanted them to be and again there was very little support in terms of the toy line didn't last very long either yeah and there was a tv series but it was only the original g1 series with a new title sequence or something right so there really wasn't the same support i suppose for the comic that the original had enjoyed and I think by then there was a lot of competition, you know, in terms of stuff like Turtles and and all these other toy lines that, you know, I don't think the appetite was there for Transformers in the same way as it was originally. And just generally, neither was our audience, unfortunately. And Marvel also was a different company at that point, too, I would imagine. Uh, you know, they, this is probably the start of their own financial issues and such. I don't know if that had to play into it at all. It, it may well have done, you know, maybe in a, a different Marvel, they'd have supported the G2 comic for longer. But yeah, things were happening clearly behind the scenes at Marvel during 1993 and 1994 that led to a bit of a kind of industry-wide implosion right. in the mid-90s. So, yeah, you know, maybe it was just, you know, right comic, wrong time as well as anything. It was nice that you were able to uh, reconnect with Wildman and Senior on this book as well. Yeah, you know, I mean, we really didn't expect that to happen. I mean, originally, Andrew was always destined to draw some of issue two. 
because it tied into his run on the G.I. Joe comic. Right. Um, so, we, you know, that was, we were more than happy. And, you know, and Generation 2 had had its launch pad in the G, uh, G.I. Joe comic. You know, there were a kind of lead-in issues, the G2, over four issues or five issues of G.I. Joe. So it felt right to have Andrew involved with issue two when we crossed over with that again. But, you know, really, I think when we started out, we were hopeful that Derek Yaniger would draw all the issues. Okay. But Derek Derek just wasn't, you know, fast enough. He, you know, his art was utterly brilliant, but he just wasn't keeping to a monthly schedule. Yeah. So in the end, we had to bring Manny Galen in as the sort of the, the stand-in artist and ultimately yeah jeff sort of rounded things out with the you know the final few issues pitching in which was you know not a shame to have either of them but you know i really would have loved derek to have been able to draw each and every one of those issues because i really loved his stuff for sure yeah and just the continuity uh, is nice for sure yeah. um so looking back at your time with the u.s transformers in the, these early days uh if you could go back and and redo a concept would you is there anything that comes to mind that you would do that you would change um not very much i mean i if i'd known before issue 75 that we had till issue 80 i may have either stretched things out so that we finished with the unicron battle or more or less you know had the unicron battle and something more focused for the last five issues right. instead of building up several multiple new storylines that we then couldn't finish off or do justice to right that makes sense wow uh, but you know otherwise I'm, i you know i still think you know it holds up reason reasonably well as a read you know especially yeah. as we get going with the whole unicron saga oh definitely yeah it's uh it- it still holds up today for sure. I mean, I'm only reading these, uh, believe it or not, for the first time now. So, and I'm I'm really enjoying them. It, it's fantastic stuff. What is your what's a highlight for you from if you could pick one issue that you think uh, you can either G one or G two of these early Marvel issues? Which one would it be? Um, that's a tough one. I mean, I think probably issue seventy five. Yeah. Just because it was. You know, the stuff I love, you know, sort of war on all fronts for, you know, huge cosmic stakes, you know, and I think Jeff did it majorly justice. And, uh, you know, I think that's the one that stands out for me. But, you know, I love uh, that kind of little period with issue 60 into 61 also really enjoyed and and probably the whole sort of mega ratchet issue you know i just love that cover of andrews yeah for that one totally that one's great uh wow so and you're still working on transformers to these to, to this day right i am yes you know sort of yeah, every now and then they let me play with the toys again and <laughs> and you know i really i've really really enjoyed doing transformers 84 for idw yeah which has allowed us to sort of dip back into those founding, grounding stories, both US and UK, and reveal more elements about them or twists and turns you didn't see in the original. And that's been really, really fun to do. And looping stories like Man of Iron, the first UK story, more cohesively into the US continuity. Oh, yeah. So, you know, this, that's been really enjoyable. And and yeah, you know, it's it's lovely that, you know, I still get to work on, uh, there's a game called Earth Wars, which I write a lot of the stuff for. And, you know, every now and then, you know, yet another thing bubbles up and I'm back in that world again. So, you know, it's been, it's been great for me, my whole career, really, it's shaped and guided everything. Wow. Transformers. So, you know, I've got a lot to be thankful and grateful for. Yeah, definitely. Uh, is there anything currently that you're working on that you would like to promote? Sure. Yeah. Well, you know, talking about Jeff Senior, Jeff and I, you know, finally got to do what we'd always promised ourselves we'd do, which was a creator own project, which we would, you know, put out ourselves or put out through a publisher that would allow us to maintain kind of complete control over it. So we got together, we sort of channeled a lot of our 
the, the sort of the we we'd done this series called Dragon's Claws back in the late eighties yeah. that was sort of futuristic sci fi, had a kind of gaming element to it almost. And we've turned this into a new project called To the Death, which came out over the course of uh, 2019 and early 2020. And it's a 10 issue maxi series. And uh, that's all out there now. And, you know, we've put it into slip cases and it's in an anthology comic at the moment here in the UK as well. So it's been really nice to do. And you know, working with Jeff in a very free form, you know, I used to, I did the lightest of almost Marvel plot style scripts and just let Jeff go wild with it. Nice. That sounds and fantastic. And so, you know, it's been very good to get that out. And, you know, it's it, it's nice because it's all ours and, you know, we, we can just expand on that universe in the future as well. Right. Is that uh, is that available here in the U.S. or the North America as well? It, it's available in as much as you can order it from the U.K. I mean, okay. postage and ship might be an issue, but yes, I mean, you know, there are no barriers to it. It's just literally the weight and the postage of it that's right. somewhat you. But yeah, we 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 did it through um, a company and a comics website called uh, GetMyComics.com. Okay, and Get My Comics have a dedicated to the death area and shop. And, you know, you can pick them up now in their slipcase sets. It's a 10 issue prestige format series. And we put those into two custom slipcases so that, you know, they're more or less function like two graphic novels now. And yeah, they're they're you know still available to to read by from getmycomics.com and they do ship worldwide. Perfect. Well, there you go. Let's check out some new stuff from uh, from Simon and uh, and Jeff. That sounds fantastic. Any last words? Anything you want to say to our listeners here? I uh, I think that we've kind of talked about enough about the UK. Oh, I will say that I'd love to have you on the show again at some point to talk specifically about the UK stuff because we really only focused on the US, and there is a, a lot of history. Um, behind the UK Transformers as well that I'd love to, to talk to you about. Yeah, sure. Happy to do that. And yeah, anything to add? I don't know. Only that Transformers has, has like I say, been my whole comics career, really. You know, it, was, it wasn't it was the first thing I wrote in comics, but it was a very close second. Yeah. And, you know, here I am 36 to 37 years later, still writing and involved in the worlds of Transformers. And so, you know, I just want to say, a big thank you to all the fans who have who have kept me there, who've kept buying the stuff and come back for Regeneration One and Transformers eighty four and and whatever else is coming up next. So yeah, just a, a big thank you to the fans for keeping me in work basically. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh thank you again, Simon, for being on our, our show. I appreciate you being here. And uh, we hope that you have all the best of luck with your endeavors with uh, with Jeff Senior. Yeah, thank you. Many thanks, Curtis, and thanks for the arm. <laughs>